Behold, my servant shall act wisely. He shall be high and lifted up and shall be exalted. As many were astonished at you, his appearance was so marred behind, beyond human semblance, and his form beyond that of the children of mankind. So shall he sprinkle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths because of him. For that which has not been told them they see, and that which they have not heard they understand. Who has believed what he has heard from us? And to whom has the arm of God been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant, and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him, and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by man, men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and is one from whom men hide their faces. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions, and he was crushed for our iniquities, and upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray, we have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed, and he was afflicted, and yet he opened not his mouth, like a lamb that is led to the, sh- <laughs> like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that is before its shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. And as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off from the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people? And they made his grave with the wicked and with the rich man in his death, although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He, had put, he has put him to grief. And when his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring, and he shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand, and out of the anguish of his soul he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul to death, And was numbered with the transgressors, yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, Ben. Uh, My name is Austin Lennox. I'm one of the staff members here at Redeemer. If I haven't met you yet, I would love to rectify that after the service. Uh, What we've been doing here at Redeemer during this season of Advent, this season of waiting, is that we've been looking at these songs in the book of Isaiah called the Servant Songs. And they're called that because they're all about this servant, this hero uh, that is promised by God that he was going to send that was essentially going to redeem the entire nation of Israel, but also, in a way, redeem the entire universe. Uh, That this servant, this hero that they sing about, uh, was going to right all the wrongs in the world. And we see that these songs find their fulfillment and their culmination in the person and work of Jesus Christ. So much so that uh, commentators and theologians throughout the centuries have called Isaiah the fifth gospel. Right, We have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John in the New Testament. They're all about the life and death of Jesus. And Isaiah is so much so about the person and work of Jesus, they've called it a fifth gospel. Because it's all about Jesus, all about what he is and what he does for us. And um, me and my wife Meredith were at a wedding last weekend in New Orleans. And something that the uh, officiant, I think is the word, uh, made me think about was that when I started dating Meredith, At some point in the course of us hanging out and spending time together, I realized this thing was headed somewhere. This thing was headed towards a destination, and it was this hope of of getting married. And that that day that was hopefully in the future, the fact that we were waiting for that day started to color and change and dictate the way that we related to each other. We were moving towards this destination, and then 
The day comes. Right? The season of waiting is over. Uh, May 2nd of 2020, at the height of the COVID pandemic, we got married in, in Meredith's backyard in Oxford, Mississippi. We had 10 people, uh, and it was perfect. Uh, we, we had friends who showed up unbeknownst to us, and they lined the sidewalks of Meredith's neighborhood uh, to cheer us on and hold up signs while we were driving a little red convertible. Uh, and someone even, someone even threw a roll of toilet paper in the car with us because we were in the midst of like a national TP shortage. Uh, <laughs> I, th- I think they wrote, like, you're going to need this. <laughs> um, and so it was amazing, right? It was amazing. And, and now, right, now that day, our wedding day, colors and dictates and shapes the way that we relate to each other now. Right? Do, you, do you see that, that, that our wedding day, waiting for that, was what kind of colored and shaped and dictated how we related to each other. And then now that day came and afterwards, that same day is, is what helps us relate to each other today. And I say all that to say that when these servant songs were written by Isaiah, the, the nation of Israel and everyone who trusted in their God at Yahweh, they were waiting, right? They were waiting for this servant to come, and that waiting shaped their entire existence. And now we can look back at the fact that he has come, right? We look back at Jesus and we say, okay, now the fact that the day has come shapes and changes everything about how we live and how we understand the world, and so I want to think about our specific song today in three ways, three quick ways. Uh, we have a universal problem, we have an unexpected hero, and we have an unexpected happening. So a universal problem, an unexpected hero, and an unexpected happening. And so first, the universal problem. If you look in verse 6 again, right, this is kind of the centerpiece and the apex of the song, if you will. The, the, the first half is kind of flowing to this verse, and, and the second half of the song is flowing from it. And it's all centered around this idea that we, like sheep, have gone astray. Right? That we all, like sheep, have gone astray. And it says we all, right? It, this is a universal problem. This, this affects every single human being, that we, like sheep, have gone astray. And... Uh, I don't know if you know this, but the Bible refers to human beings as sheep over 400 times, uh, and it is not a compliment. That is not, that's not a compliment. They uh, are cute to us, but we're not farmers. We don't realize you know, that they, they're really hard to deal with. Uh, they are grazers, which means they follow their appetite. Uh, they live their entire life with their heads down, consuming and eating for hours and hours. They'll just move from, from one patch to another. They're driven by their appetite so much so that they will eat until nothing's left, and then they don't know what to do. They don't know how to like go find more, and so they have to have someone lead them to new food, to better pastures, or else they will die of starvation. Doesn't that sound like us? Without this guidance, right, they will naturally wander off. They will get lost. Things will happen. They'll get into trouble. I don't know if you are familiar with the 2004 internet celebrity Shrek the Sheep. Anybody heard of Shrek the Sheep? He was a merino wool sheep in New Zealand that somehow was able to evade his shearers for six years. Uh, and he was living in caves to do this. He was like, he somehow was able to run away from the people that were trying to catch him for six years. Uh, and when he was caught, uh, his, his shepherds, his shears said that he was unrecognizable. Uh, they're on record saying he looked like a biblical character. Uh, he, was so, uh, he was so overgrown. He, he had grown a fleece that weighed 27 kilograms, which for Americans, that means 60 pounds. So he had a 60-pound fleece. Uh, when, they, when they finally did shear him, uh, they made suits for 20 extra large people from this one sheep. You, you need to look the pictures up after the service. Uh, they, they, they are objectively hilarious. And it can be easy to laugh at. But this also happens all the time uh, to sheep who are not famous, who do not get found, and who die. Because if Shrek, they were saying, if he had fallen over the right way in the wrong place, he would never have been able to get back up. He, he would have needed someone to help him up, and, and he wouldn't have had that, and he would have died. And some of these sheep, right, when they wander away, they, they starve, they get trapped, uh, they drown, they'll suffer disease. Sheep get into a lot of trouble when they wander away uh, from the person who's trying to lead them and guide them, and so do we, right? So do we. The, the language in verse 6 is active, right? With a sheep, you're like, oh, that's kind of cute. It's like accidentally. It's just doing its own thing. But with us, right, it says, we have all turned. We do it. We turn, and we say, I want to go my own way. 
right? I want to do my own thing. I, I don't want to be led. I'd rather just kind of lead myself. And the Bible says that what that happens, uh, or that when that happens, bad things, bad things happen. Uh, and so hopefully you're seeing why sheep is such a perfect picture of humanity. It's because we are driven by our appetites, right? We're driven by our appetites, whether it's literal food or whether it's a hunger for safety and security or wealth or social status. I have like 30 things listed here, right? Being at the top of your class, right? Making the best grades, uh, a life of ease and comfort and solitude, all of these appetites that we have for fulfillment, uh, for sexual expression, whatever it is, We live with our head down, constantly consuming, just being led by what we want, what we're hungry for. And when we are led by our appetites, our appetites will lead us astray. If we let our appetites lead us and guide us, then we will be led astray. Uh, And our lives will become marked by the things that you read about in verses 4 and 5, right? Things like grief and sorrow and transgression and iniquity. Uh, and that word, iniquity, that last word, it's actually a really interesting word uh, in, in the original Hebrew. It, to paraphrase Richie Sessions, this word iniquity, it's like a swamp. He calls it a swamp of sin because it's not only the twisted, messed up things that we do, things that we say, and things that we think. Iniquity is the idea of all of those things and their effects, their consequences. It, it's, it's, it's like this big swamp that like all the, thi- all the twisted, messed up things that we've done, thought, said, and their consequences and their effects and the way that that's moved out into the world and affected it, right? See, our problem is universal, not just because it affects everyone. It's universal because it affects everything, right? Everything in this world has been touched by this, this idea of sin and iniquity, Maybe you all know about the butterfly effect. I'm not talking about the movie that I was never allowed to watch as a kid. Um, but, but, but it was kind of based on this idea, um, this theory that um, small actions and complex systems can, can ripple out and, and create huge ramifications. And the big example, uh, Daniel Terry, you can tell me if I'm wrong later, uh, he's a very smart guy, was that um, a butterfly flapping its wings over here in North America could, could do things and set into you know, action this chain of events that could cause hurricanes and crazy weather patterns in... Uh, you know, on the other side of the globe. But, but the idea is just that nothing happens in a vacuum, right? N- nothing happens in a vacuum. We don't live our lives in a vacuum. Everything that we do has consequences and effects, and they ripple out into the world. And so it's a universal problem. It doesn't just affect everyone. It affects everything. And there's two sides to this, right? There's, there's things that we've done and there's things that's been there are things that have been done to us, right? Things that we've done and things that have been done to us. And so, sure, most of our problem is what we do. We get ourselves into a lot of trouble. But some of it is, you know, what other people have done to us. Uh, ways that your parents have failed you and hurt you. The way uh, that being sinned against by friends and by family will affect you. Uh, have y'all ever heard this phrase that um, hurt people will hurt people? Hurt people will hurt people. And so some of us really are. We, we're, we're stuck in, the, in these cycles of behavior and, and addiction. And in some way, it's, it really is inherited. It's inherited from people who have gone before us. Um, families and communities and systems that we've come from. And I do not say that to like absolve any of us of guilt because uh, we really have done wrong. Uh, but I, just, I say that to just show how universal this problem is and how unescapable it is and how deep that it goes. Because we'll look up and, and we're in the throes of addiction and we've got broken marriages and broken families and we deal with poverty, whether that's financial or relational or spiritual. And our lives are marked by burned bridges and mistakes and selfish choices and it's universal. All of mankind is marked by this, this, this crookedness, this bentness towards iniquity. Uh, and so if I could paraphrase Francis Schaeffer, he says, Look, the real problem, the real dilemma for humanity is that we have a moral guilt before God the creator, that we have a real moral ob- 
objective guilt before God. Not just feelings of guilt, but real objective guilt. And he says that to, to any other explanation uh, for Christianity and what we're trying to, to talk about here, any other explanation for, for, for that is a cruel illusion. Right? Any other explanation for our problem other than real, objective, moral guilt before God is a cruel illusion. And that's why I put this line in the, in the front of your bulletin by him. He says, once the truth of God's existence is known to us and we know that we have true moral guilt before a holy God, then we should be glad to know that the solution to our dilemma and the solution is from God's side, not ours. And so if that's the universal problem, what's the solution? Right? If this problem affects everyone and affects everything, how do we get out of it? Well, I want to say that the, the solution is two things. We, we have an unexpected hero, and we have an unexpected happening. Uh, so first, an unexpected hero. Uh, look at verse 2 in your bulletin, in chapter 53. It, it, it's talking about this servant, this hero that's going to come. It says this, He has no form or majesty that we should look at him, and no beauty that we should desire him. Essentially, it's saying this servant is going to be obscure and weird, and he's going to repulse people, right? This servant, this substitutionary servant is going to be obscure and weird and repulsive to people. And it just made me think, when I was a kid and I saw all these, like, beautiful oil portraits of Jesus, he always looked like a mixture of, like, Brad Pitt and Fabio. Like, he, he was always just this, like, beauty standard of, like, Western masculinity. It was, it was as if highlights existed in ancient Israel. You know, he had this, like, beautiful flowing, you know, brunette blonde hair. He was always, like, ripped, uh, very strong looking, very handsome. And you just do not get that in the New Testament. That's just not the Jesus that we get. There's really no comment made about what he looked like. Uh, when he traveled with his disciples, it wasn't like some movie where he's got this glow about him and people are just naturally drawn to him. Like the woman at the well in John 4, she had no idea who she was talking to. Right? So much so that even John the Baptist at the end of his life was like, are you the guy? Is this the guy? Is this the guy we're waiting on? His own family didn't believe in him. Uh, his friends go on to deny him and reject him. And the, re the religious elite of the people that he came to save, they plot to kill him. And they reject him. And it's as if God is saying, yep, yeah, that's our God, just like we drew it up. Right? Look, I, I got to tread lightly here. I've already been chastised for um, Harry Potter spoilers. But, uh, but this is from book one. So hopefully you've made your way past it. This doesn't really like give anything away. But uh, in book one of Harry Potter, it's called The Sorcerer's Stone, uh, you get this character named Neville Longbottom. And Neville is a very shy, awkward, quiet, forgetful, strange boy. And uh, during the climax of the action of the book, you see, Neville catches Harry and Hermione and Ron, and they're sneaking out of their dormitory uh, to get into mischief and shenanigans. And Neville stands up to them. Very uncharacteristically, he stands up and he says, I'm not going to let you do this. You're, you're sneaking out at night, that's against the rules, and you're gonna, you've already you know, taken away so many points from Gryffindor, our house. I'm not going to let you keep going. And he pays for that, right? Because Hermione like, immediately like, petrifies him, he lands on the floor. Um, and then they go off and do mischief and save the world and, and, and stuff like that. But, um, but at the end of the movie... When Dumbledore, the, the headmaster of Hogwarts, when he's tallying up all the points that the houses have received throughout the year to award the House Cup, you get to the end and Gryffindor, right, which is Neville and Harry's house, is tied with Slytherin. And you do not have to have read Harry Potter to know which is the bad guy, right? Slytherin. And so they're tied until, right at the last second, Dumbledore awards Neville Longbottom 10 points. Because standing up to your friends to do what's right is really hard and really difficult. And so in this crazy fashion, right, Neville Longbottom is the guy who, like, wins the House Cup for Gryffindor for the first time in seven years. And so people lose their minds, you know, they're, like, picking him up like Rudy and stuff like that. And look, it's such a magical moment because it's Neville. Right, like, think about how, like, that, it wouldn't be spectacular if, like, Harry did that. You're like, well, of course, he got, like, all the points. He does all the stuff. It's Neville. And so the fact that this unexpected hero is the one who saves the day makes everything so much more spectacular and awesome and beautiful. I, I once heard someone say that grace 
this thing that we like to talk about here all the time, right, that God loves us in spite of our flaws, that he forgives us, that grace, it's almost like a good joke. Because in a good joke, you never see the punchline coming. Right? You never see the punchline coming. And when you finally get to it, you just explode with delight and joy and laughter. Right? Grace is like a good joke. Because look, in the ancient Israelite mind and in our mind, the heroes that we idolize are people who can come in and just annihilate evil and destroy it through politics or power or military strength. Just someone who can just defeat things through, through strength, right, and through authority and through aggression. And God says, you know, that, that's too expected. That makes too much sense. That's not big enough, right? That's not impressive enough for me. It's not awe-inspiring enough. And so what we get in the Gospels, this servant is an unexpected hero. What we get is Jesus Christ, a man who is not beautiful by the world's standards and who actually, as we're going to see, the way he wins is by losing. And the way that he's actually strong is that he becomes weak, and so if we have this universal problem, right, iniquity that affects all of us and has affected everything, and we get this unexpected hero who's going to save the day, uh, the solution also has an unexpected happening, this unexpected event. And this event, this happening, is that the servant himself is actually going to be destroyed. That's the, that's the big climax that we've all been waiting for, is that this servant, this hero that we've been waiting on, is going to get destroyed. He's going to die. He's going to get beaten, right, to beat evil this guy has to get beaten, right? To win, he must lose. So look at verse 14 um, in your passage again. This is describing the servant. It says, His appearance was so marred beyond human semblance and his form beyond that of the children of mankind. And what this is talking about is that in Jesus' passion, right, in his crucifixion, Jesus was beaten into what one commentator says, he calls it a shockingly inhuman mass of wounded flesh. That that's what's going to happen to our hero. Right? And, and if you look, right, this, this, this utter destruction of the servant in verse 14 is actually how verse 15 is possible. Right? It says that he's going to be destroyed, so shall he sprinkle many nations. And you might be like, what the heck does that mean? sprinkling many nations. What, what, what does that mean? Well, it, it, it's hearkening back to this idea in the Old Testament called the Day of Atonement. You can go read about this in Leviticus 16 if you want later. And uh, the Day of Atonement happened once a year, and part of the Day of Atonement was that they would take this lamb, this pure, spotless, unblemished lamb from the herds, and they would sacrifice it. And the high priest, right, the high priest, this one man over Israel, he would take it and he would take the blood and he would put it on a branch and he would go into the Holy of Holies, which was the center of the Old Testament temple. And there's this thing called the Ark of the Covenant and the mercy seat, you know, all this Old Testament stuff. And he would take this branch covered in this innocent lamb's blood and he would sprinkle it on the mercy seat. And then he would actually take that same branch and the same blood, and he would go to the crowns of people, the Israelites, and he would sprinkle them. And I, I get that that sounds like barbaric and weird and primitive and old-fashioned, but, but what they were getting at was the truth that, like, something had to take their place, right? If something is going to deal with my sin, something has to take my place. And the lamb that was slain, this perfect, spotless, unblemished lamb, symbolized that. It symbolized that those who deserve to be destroyed are spared through the destruction of a substitute. Right? That that's the theme that you find throughout all of Scripture. But th this is why I have a line from National Treasure in your bulletin. Uh, because there's this great moment at the end of the movie where the police officer, I think it's Agent Sandusky, he finally catches up uh, to Nicolas Cage and all of his pals. And they're the good guys, right? They, they've been doing all this stuff, but they stole the Declaration of Independence, right? Crimes have been committed. And this police agent says, look, Ben, someone's got to go to prison. Right? Someone's got to go to prison. Wrong has been done. Justice has to be served. Someone's got to go to jail. 
And it made me think about this story uh, that I read in a book by Ricky Jones a few years ago. Uh, and he tells this story that took place in ancient China. This was centuries ago. And in this story, there's this town bailiff, right? And he goes to the local judge and he says, hey, someone's been caught stealing water. And actually, the law uh, of our town at this day and age says that if you've been caught stealing water, uh, you have to receive 40 blows while being tied to a stake. And so he goes and he tells the judge about this, and the judge follows him you know, to the accused. And the bailiff takes him to the person in question, and it's the judge's mother. It's the judge's own mother who was caught stealing water and who is accused. And so the judge has this enormous problem on his hands. Right? On one hand, he loves his mom. And on the other hand, if he makes an exception for her, the whole town will descend into chaos. Uh, justice will not have been done. Uh, righteousness will not have been upheld. And so he has this problem. He, he has to be just. Right? He's the king. He has to be righteous. And so he convicts his mom. And the town gathers outside, and he says to her, right, you have committed a crime, and your sentence is to receive 40 blows while being tied to a stake. And so as she's being tied uh, to the stake, what happens is the judge removes his robe, and he goes and he envelops his mother, and he tells the bailiff, every blow needs to fall on my back. Right? Do, you, do you see? Like, grace is this... It's this beautiful punchline. It's this unexpected, beautiful thing that causes delight and joy. Right? Her judge becomes her savior. Her judge becomes her savior. And that's exactly what we get in the Gospels, that our judge, our God, has made a way for us to be saved. And it's that he is going to become this servant, and he's going to substitute himself for us. Right, look at verses 4 and 5 together. It's a, there's this refrain, there's this common theme where it says, He is going to bear our griefs. Right, Our sorrows, He's going to carry that. He is going to be pierced for the things that we have done, our transgressions. The iniquity that we have that we deserve to be crushed for, He's actually going to be crushed in our place. This is why Jesus so often gets called the Lamb of God. It's because, yes, he was perfect and spotless and innocent and beautiful, but right, remember Leviticus 16, remember the atonement. It's because he was crushed for us. He was crushed for his people. And it is so wild and so unbelievable and so unexpected that verse 15 says, kings are going to shut their mouths because of him. It's this picture that wise, powerful people are, are going to be speechless and in awe of what's happening. Right? Uh, chapter 53, verse 1 starts by saying, essentially, no one's going to believe this. Who has believed what we have told him? No one's going to believe this. The unexpected solution to all of our problems is that people who deserve to be destroyed get spared because of the destruction of a substitute. Right? Jesus Christ took rejection so that you could be accepted. Jesus Christ, the only guilty person in the history of the world, was treated as if he was guilty, so that truly guilty people like us could be treated as if they're innocent before God. And look, this, this objective sin problem, it, it's not like he just forgives you and wipes it away and sweeps it under the rug. Like Someone had to receive punishment for it, right, for God to be just. And so... Right? God had a problem. <laughs> do I destroy these people for what they've done, or do I love them and save them? And the solution is, I'll, I'll take it. I'll take the destruction. I'll take the pain. I'll send my son, the servant. He'll suffer in their place. And so your sin was either punished on the cross of Jesus Christ, or you have to bear it. Right? God cannot be unjust. He cannot be unfair. He has to be honest and righteous. Either you bear the weight and take the punishment for your sin, or Jesus has done it for you. Those are the only two options we get. And, and I can see how it almost sounds noble to say, well, you know what? I'll just take it. I'll take it. It feels wrong to let Jesus take that for me. I'll just bear it. And I get that that might sound noble, um, but to do that, it's rejecting the very heart of God 
that's on display for you in Jesus. God is trying to give you this gift and for you to say, you know what, I, I'll pay for it. it. It's to reject the gift of God. So take it. Take it. Um, look, this is the last thing I'll say um, before we wrap up, but I, I just have to, I have to focus on one more thing and then we'll be done. Look, the beauty of the gospel is not just what Jesus has done for us past tense, right? Like, that's amazing. He suffered and died in the place of people who don't deserve it. That's incredible. And there's even more good news on top of that, and it's that there is something that he is doing for us constantly right now. And that's, what, that's where this song starts to answer the question, because maybe you sit there and you're like, okay, you say the same thing every Sunday. I get it. Jesus in my place. How does that help me on like a Thursday afternoon when I like have to be me and like deal with my kids or deal with my work or deal with my boss or deal with my spouse? Look at verse 7, right? In, in verse 7, it says that in the midst of oppression and affliction, this servant, it says that he opened not his mouth. Uh, like a lamb led to the slaughter, right? Leviticus 16, Day of Atonement. Like a lamb led to the slaughter, he opens not his mouth. That's a weird detail to include. But when you get to the Gospels, when you get to Matthew 27, you see that when Jesus was accused, right, by the, by the Pharisees, the chief priests, and the elders, he's standing before Pontius Pilate and says he gave no answer. That he did not speak up to defend himself. And Pontius Pilate is kind of incredulous, and he says, like, D do you not hear uh, how many things they're testifying against you? Do you not want to, like, speak up and, and defend yourself? And it says that he gave him no answer. When Jesus is standing before the judgment of Pontius Pilate, he's silent and he doesn't fight back. Why? So that he has to go to the cross. So that he has to suffer and die for his people. Because that's what he came to do. And he was silent then. So that at his resurrection and ascension, when he ascends into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father, he can speak for you forever. Right? He was silent before Pilate so that he can speak for you forever to advocate for you. Look at the end of, of verse 12. It says, he bore the sins of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. And intercession just simply means to pray for. And so do, do you realize that? That like part of what Jesus is and who he is and what he's done, it's not just what he did, it's what he's doing right now. That He is praying for you. He's praying for you. If you are like me, 99% of the time you just think, I, I bet Jesus is pretty frustrated with me. I bet he's pretty fed up. And I bet he's at the end of his rope with someone like me. And scripture says, he's praying for you. He's praying for you. And so if you, if you ever find yourself sitting in um, your past mistakes and your failures and you feel helpless and you know that you're not whole and, and you start to feel flushed and you start cringing uh, because of the things that you've done and thought and said... And you start to think that, like, if I could just do this enough, that I'm, like, doing God a favor. If I could just sit in this guilt and this shame and just soak it in, that I'm kind of, like, doing God a favor. Right? That I'm, that you're almost saying, like, well, maybe, maybe he'll pity me enough to forgive me. Maybe I can feel bad enough for what I've done and that that will pay for my sins. Making a practice of doing that, of sitting there in, in your shame and your failures and just stewing in it, that is refusing to believe in the promise of the suffering servant. That that stuff hasn't just been forgiven and wiped away, but that something has objectively been done about that. They have been paid for. And so this is why I put um, a Robert Murray McShane quote in your bulletin. He's this really old, dead Presbyterian. He said, if I could hear Christ praying for me, in the next room, I would not fear a million enemies. Yet distance makes no difference. He is praying for me. And it's all over the New Testament. Romans 8, John 2, Hebrews 7. And look, the only way it's possible for Jesus to do that is if he's alive. 
right? That death did not defeat him, that your sin did not defeat him, that he defeated it. That he rose again from the dead and ascended into heaven and he sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty, making intercession for you right now as an advocate. So Jesus doesn't want your pity, right? He wants your worship. He doesn't want you to look at what he did to, to, to save you and for you to pity him and feel bad for him. He wants you to worship him, right? This didn't defeat him. He rules and reigns in heaven and he prays for people. And so if you trust Jesus, you have an advocate. You have have someone who's interceding and praying for you constantly. A substitutionary servant who has taken all of your guilt, all of your shame, and all of your iniquity on himself, and he's beaten it. If you'll just let him. If you'll just trust him enough to give it to him. That's an invitation. Let's pray. Um, Heavenly Father, we thank you that the unexpected punchline of the gospel of grace is that you have put yourself in our place. May we never get over that. May we be people who live lives of explosive and infectious joy and laughter at the incredulous claims of Scripture that you love us enough, uh, that you came and that you got us uh, through your death and resurrection, we might have life. So make, make yourself beautiful to us this morning. We need your help. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.